This is, a, this is a seminar that actually looks at different disciplines. And that does make a lot of sense. And what I think is in there as a message for everybody that is in training and going to other disciplines in the future is the fact that while you have, if you want a common trunk of general medicine, of diseases that are relevant for a lot of individuals, you have medical specialization, which is good. It is, it's very useful. You have to be specialized in a certain area. You have to be a super expert on something else. If it comes, however, to disease mechanisms, pathophysiology, things that are in public terms very much related, there comes an end to where specialization is a useful thing. And that has to do, for example, with a lot of chronic diseases that affect the lungs and the heart and the endocrine system. So COPD is, if you want, one of the classical examples where super specialization has driven the field but in terms of understanding relevance to human disease and to a human being, you need to step back and you have to understand that this is something that affects many people, affects people at a higher age, affects people that not only have this disease. And that has ramifications that are interesting because it tells you if you understand something mechanistically for one part, you may understand something else in a related disease area. And this is what these seminars are all about. And this is what my talk about CPD is all about. If it would ever work, we'll have slides. If not, it doesn't matter. So if you look at the disease from a, from a pulmonary perspective, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is something that is related to cigarette smoking in Modena, Bologna, Emilia Romagna, down to Padua. And it's probably true for most of the population here, comma, but. It is something that is um, affecting a lot of individuals in, in around the world. So if you are interested in some of the figures that, that people have produced, you realize that the number of individuals dying from diseases such as COPD is something which is actually quite sizable. And if you look at the latest figures from the European Respiratory Society, a society that you ought to know because it's very important, it organizes research and education for the clinicians that are interested in the lung, but not only in the lung, also in other things. You realize that from these data, if you look at the, uh, the world of the European Union, it's about 2.5% of people dying from that disease. What you also see, I think, which is very important for you to notice, that if you look at ischemic heart disease, it's 2.4 million. That's annual deaths, annual, every year, annual. So, a lot of these people that die from so-called ischemic heart disease will have had COPD. And what I'm trying to tell you is that these numbers are very likely wrong because they underestimate this. These 2.3% are only the people that have on their death certificate COPD. A lot of people that have their death certificate ischemic heart disease have also bad lung function. And I'll give you some reasons for that. And also, 1.7 million uh, die, in fact, um, from diabetes. And diabetes is also something which is very much and very closely linked and related to that. Not to note uh, lung cancer, and you see the figures there, thank you very much, this is gone now. And it has related to the, to the risk factors, you know, that, that what, what smoking is doing. Now, the question is, what is it? The disease for the pulmonary guy is a disease that is related to some form of lung function impairment, and the lung function impairment, we measure in FEV1, that is the, the spirometry that you have, and what we think is that the disease is progressive. It's progressive over time. And when you see these little blips there, that looks like an ECG, these are things that we call exacerbations. And what you see on the right side, and if I find a pointer, I can point out to this where you want to be. What you see on the right side, you see that individuals, when they progress with the disease, have comorbid conditions. And one of the comorbid conditions is cardiovascular diseases. It's not only the physiology that drives it. It's something else, thank you. It's something else that is very important. These changes that are related to the, to the lung produce something like this. They com it produces individuals with a phenotype. And it produces individuals that are very different because you know them. Even though you're young and you're sort of mediudicating, it produces individuals that are the slim type on the right. This guy is probably more likely having an emphysema. He sort of, you know, has a, has a bad muscle and bone situation. And the left one is a person that has a bit of edema. We say in Germany, he stands a little bit in water. Probably has a bad heart as well. He's a myocardial insufficiency. He may have diabetes. He may have cough and phlegm. And the other one on the right-hand side is primarily dyspneic. 
Now, they are both superdeep and they both follow to some extent this pathophysiology, but it produces what we call a phenotype. Phenos, you can see it, you can feel it, you can taste it. These people are different. And this is what medicine is about. The cardiologists look at COPD at something probably very differently, because I showed you the pulmocentric world. Lung function decline, comorbidities, and change in status. A, cardiology may, a cardiologist may say it's a slowly progressive cardiovascular disease, which is masked through pulmonary effects. Why is that? If the same individual with the same form of life, smoke exposure and symptoms would get to a cardiology ward or the cardiology ICU, the likelihood that is labeled as a cardiac patient is much higher if, than if the same patient would be admitted to a pulmonary ICU or an emergency room. And this is because these diseases are overlapping to, to a large extent. And why is this? Well, it is because something I want to explain to you, what, how they are common, but it's also because they share a common risk factor, because most of these people would have smoked. And therefore, the definitions have to do with the angle that you look at this, and this is why this is very important to do. Dr. Van Rutten it comes from the Netherlands. He is a generalist. He is a cardiologist that is interested in lung function, and he made this wonderful definition from a cardiologist, what COPD could be, which I very much like. So what we looked at, and, and Professor Farby that you all know has been sort of been very much involved in this over the last couple of years, that we look at, from our point of view, at the lung as the center of the universe, that's what pulmonologists do. If I was a cardiologist, the heart would be in the center, so that's the limit of specialization. Here we are. We realized that there are other organ systems, namely the heart, namely the endocrine, that is diabetes and insulin tolerance, and probably the muscle that do play a major role in the development of the disease, and we call them comorbidities, although there's some weakness with this. They could be associated with the health status, or they could be cause related, and we don't know that. The last point for this introduction about what is COPD has to do with this. I told you the decline of lung function exacerbations, but I also told you that it produces different phenotypes, phenotypic changes in the individuals. But what it also does the disease is an umbrella term from a pulmonologist's point of view that probably has two major components. And the one of the components is the airway component. This has something to do with diameter, mucosal swelling, mucus production, and so on and so forth. That is a neutrophilic, elastase, ILA-aid driven process. And they have, a, they have a clinical presentation. Next to this, you find another process that we call emphysema which is airspace enlargement, which happens very much in the periphery of the lung. And although we put both of these items, uh, items, airway and emphysema, into the same umbrella, they're very likely to represent very two different distinct pathways. They are both called COPD, and they exist and coexist in varying, varying severity and forms in individuals, but it's very likely that the process that drives mucus secretion, that drives mucus cell hyperplasia, is very, very much different from driving a structural abnormality, um, disappearance of alveolar structures in, in the periphery called emphysema, and the latter one probably having a very relevant autoimmune component, the former one being very much neutrophil driven, although they could coexist in the same individual, but it is very important. And this is why individuals, and this is a paper from Professor Augusti, who will talk about this later, and it comes from the Eclipse cohort, a large cohort that looked at individuals with COPD, and they tried to find out whether this theory about a systemic component and a systemic inflammation is right. And what they found is, was very interesting. And probably when you see the phenotypes and the different pathophysiology for you now not surprising anymore, that you do have individuals that have, that are non-smokers, smokers and COPD patients in there, and if you look at something like white blood cells, or TNF-alpha, or you look at R6, you realize that there is a heterogeneity in the pattern how someone would have an underlying mechanism that drives inflammation in a given point in time. And that tells you that processes, even though both of these individuals in the middle and the right of the cords have smoked, the contribution of some of those inflammatory responses or let's say the comorbid conditions for IL-6, because the liver is involved, may be something that determines the outcome of a given individual. So for the presentation of today, I would put to you, A, COPD is a heterogeneous definition of things that are very variable in pathophysiology and biology. They produce very different phenotypes in terms of patients that you see. They have some common denominators, and inflammation is one of them, and it comes to a varying degree and it will produce some sort of comorbid conditions that are relevant, i.e. respectively 
cardiovascular disease, and that's where we are from. And that tells us, and remember the first figure that I showed you, mortality, mortality of COPD, mortality of cardiovascular disease. I'm trying to convince you that what drives outcomes in COPD is the lung, but not only the lung, and also cardiovascular disease. I think it's very important. A lot of people have thought about the concept that if you look at the disease in a patient that is 65, has smoked 35 years, is a plumber, um, has had infections in the past and probably a tuberculosis in the 50s. Patient that you see presented with COPD. What makes this patient coming to you and with complaints is a mixture of all sorts of things. One way of looking at these individuals is the impairment of lung function. I think that's fine. That is a very gross measure to actually have something to do with severity. But we learned that it is a poor reflection of the whole status of this patient. And you would understand this because there's an individual behind this. Remember the picture. And there are individuals that are behind this, are individuals that have symptoms. There may be more coughing, there may be more dyspneic, they may be having sort of frequent exacerbation. So that's a com component of domain that is very important. If you have a concomitant cardiac disease, it will be there as well, because they will have symptoms of dyspnea, for example, that may be the lung, it may be the cardiac component. So you see how complex it gets. And then you have what we call sort of, you know, index scores, things that are compound measures of different activities. It is the lung function goes in there, but it's also the exercise capacity, which I will tell you something about in, in, in the end. So what we call about severity probably is not so much the right term in med medicine of today, it probably is much more the activity of the disease rather than the severity, which is important. Because activity drives the, the patient being and drives the clinical presentation. Does that work? Yes, it does. That's a paper that came out some months ago. It's from Dr. Manino, he's an epidemiologist from the US, and they developed a score that has all sorts of things. It has lung function impairment, it has symptoms, it has prior exacerbations, it has a comorbidity index, which I think is very important, and the cardiovascular scoring goes in there, and it has a quality of life, and it has body composition. We'll talk about this later. Body composition drives outcome quite a lot. And if you assign a certain score from low points to high points, does it relate to outcome? Yes, it does. If you take all these things on board and you stratify these people and you follow them up over eight years, you realize that people with a low score, that can be anything. Bad function, bad BMI, no good exercise, a lot of dyspnea. These people fare a lot better because they die less. That's the survival compared to these people that have a lot of these points. And how do you reach a lot of these points? There's various ways. If you are very core morbid, and your lung function is not that bad, but you have a lot of symptoms, you may reach the same sort of scoring. So what drives it in the end? What drives people sort of to die from the disease? One thing pulmonologists do is measure lung function. That's the very few things that we know how to do. And we keep our lives telling people that they also should measure lung function. That is what our <laughs> careers are all about. It's so rather simple, but you know, that's the mission that we have. Why do we do this? We do this for one reason, because we think that everyone is not only easy to measure and it's standardizable, but that everyone is actually a wonderful tool. Not so much to describe the lungs only. Everyone, if you want, the lacmus paper of life. If you have a bad lung function, whatever you have con concomitantly, it's not good. Now, there may be different ways to get there, but if you have it, it's not good. So if you look at people with COPD, risk factors, symptoms, a classical age if you want, and to stratify them based on their lung function only, from what we call formally gold one to gold four, you realize that if you look again at mortality, it's, it is increasing with decreasing lung function. But what is decreasing and the reason why they die? They die of cardiovascular events. So the main driver, the main driver, related to lung function impairment in that cohort seems to be events that have to do with cardiac health. Now, why is that? Is it causal? Well, I don't know. It's the same risk factor, it's the same body composition problem, and it's something that is closely related. This is why pulmonologists and cardiologists, hence the theme of that topic, need to be working closer together, closer together. Practical medicine. A patient comes to the hospital, like you in your ICU on your emergency room, and he presents with signs and symptoms of an COPD exacerbation. What do you do? Check for swabs, bacterial, uh, lung function, assessment, whatever, oxygen tension, so on and so forth. If you look at these individuals and measure their pro-BNP levels, they are coming as a large group to the ICU with 
cardiac, not, with a non-cardiac history. They are CPD exacerbations. And if you look at their pro-BNP levels, and you study their survival over time, and you look at this over four years, retrospectively from those CPD exacerbations, people with low prone BNP, medium pro BNP, high pro BNP. Outcome after an exacerbation bracket for COPD is driven by the level of pro BNP levels that the people had. Is that a pulmonary marker? No. It's a marker of overall risk, and it tells you that in an acute stage of the disease, the cardiac sort of comorbidities drive outcomes in these people as well. If that is all so easy then, and if it's everything that drives these exacerbations are comorbid conditions, there is still a few questions that we have to answer. And the question that we have to answer is that someone that obviously deteriorates at a certain time of disease with other factors, i.e. the heart, why do drugs that only work on lung function and not on, on the lungs make people better? Well, it is true, it is absolutely true that if you look at a cohort of individuals, particularly those that had a history of exacerbations, people that should have comorbid conditions, and if you treat them with bronchodilator drugs, things that don't help the heart, help the heart they may endanger the heart, but they clearly don't help the heart, or well, they may be neutral to the heart at the very best, but if you look at those and see what these drugs do, yes, they reduce exacerbations. So there is one component is, which is independent from comorbid. So, don't get me wrong, it's not everybody that dies from COPD dives of a cardiac cause. There's also mechanical components involved, but with those mechanical components comes something else that probably drives clinical presentation in these individuals, and that's the take-off message that you have. The very interesting thing is now that we learned something else, that the response to these bronchodilators is probably having also in COPD a very genetic background, which is extremely interesting. What it tells you, for example, is that if you respond to a certain therapy and you look at the ways you interact in your lungs with, let's say, bronchodilator drugs, there are drugs where the phenotype of receptor doesn't matter, anticholinergic drugs, teotropium, for example, and there are drugs like beta agonists where the receptor type that they work on does matter in terms of the relative potency. So outcome is de dependent, A, on the severity of the disease, your core morbid condition, and something which is very inherent to your lung itself, how you deal with treatment. And that is very independent and respective of comorbidities out there. This paper is coming out in three days, and I'm sure you would want to see it. Because what's happening is that if you look at those drugs right. that, actually, that, act, that act on, those, on, 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 the, on the outcomes, you realize that for most part in the COPD patients, phenotypes, genotypes would drive better outcome for, for, for anticholinergic drugs with one exception, with one, receptor with one receptor genotype that probably gives you a much better outcome for beta agonist than the other ones. And we don't understand that this, this yet, and it tells you that in the COPD population itself, there's also a genetic background for the response to therapy, which is important. The next thing is that drugs that are not meant for the heart, but look at people with that frequent exacerbate, for example, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, a new class of drug, these individuals will respond better if they have frequent events. Now, if you understand that the frequent events of exacerbations are not only the lung, they are a bit of mechanic, they're a bit of individual background, but they're also comorbidity, we have to understand, bracket, which we don't, bracket, how drugs that modulate inflammation would actually be better in some scenarios than in others because comorbidities are involved. And I give you an example how drugs, and this is why it's so important practically, how drugs that were made for the lung probably also have other effects outside this. So what about these comorbidities then? I mean, how relevant is this? Is that the buzzword of the year? Is it something that really occurs? Well, it's not the buzzword of the year, it does really occur. These other studies is a study from Dr. von Vleteren, they come from Maastricht, this is from, from the Netherlands, it came out last year in the Blue Journal, and they looked at their cohort of individuals that they have in their rehab programs, in fact. I mean, that's the cohort that it comprises of. And they had a very nifty way of assessing disease states of these individuals. And what you see, that if you're someone that is fit for rehabilitation, that has the disease, you know, by, by special, specialized care, the likelihood that these people have no other conditions is almost zero. I mean, they all have something. And it's not always that they have something, they have a lot. So, if, you know, people with a mean have three to four comorbid morbid conditions. What are these comorbid conditions? What is the percentage of comorbidities that patients with COPD, not terminal care, I mean, these are people with significant disease, but they're running around like you and me, well, almost like you and me, I guess. These people have 
in 50% hyperglycemia, 50% arteriosclerosis, almost 50% hypertension. So that's the regular cohort. So these are the people, fellows that are here that you see. These are, these are your guys. These people have all these comorbidities. So anyone that gets to you in emergency situations, in emergency care, COPD, SEC, will have something else and you need to know that. What is very relevant is, and that is a little complicated, but it's not that complicated as it looks. If you look at the likelihood of some of these associations, then you realize the redder it gets, the more likely these things are associated with, with each other. You realize that things like arteriosclerosis has a lot of red, and hyperglycemia has a lot of red. So cardiovascular and endocrine disorders is something which is extremely intricate to this disease. And this is important. Cardiovascular ones drive outcome, I told you. Lung function is an indicator of cardiovascular disease. Some of the medications will interfere with hyperglycemia, i.e. steroids. Inactivity, getting fat or in inactive, is bad for your cardiovascular system and for your hyperglycemia. So it drives in the patient population something which is relevant. So comorbidities are not a buzzword. They are important to understand for both and every specialty that there is. And Leo Fabri and Bianca have sort of done this in a, in a, in a review which I, which, I, which I liked in, a, in an editorial in the Blue Journal some time ago, in fact, some months ago. And what it says is that the underlying process of comorbidities, and especially arteriosclerosis, and the increase in inflammatory markers in a larger subset of individuals, not in everyone, but it's something that we have to, have to understand, drives obviously cardiovascular instability and vascular instability and it will sort of result into some things that we call a clinical entity, which we call a lung failure or an exacerbation, which is a composite of pulmonary things, of comorbid things, and cardiovascular ones. And it is very likely, and that to introduce that, that drugs that are not primarily intended to treat the lung classically, bronchodilators and T or Samitron and steroids, what have you, but drugs that would interfere with that process are much more likely to make a benefit and change in outcomes of individuals, and that's something what treatment algorithms will have to learn and adapt to. One example. This is a cohort from Rotterdam. These are people that come from a cardiac department, and they are getting into the database because they have arteriosclerosis. So they get endotherectomy for the carotid, for, 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 the, for, the, for the legs, whatever. They are not COPD patients sick when they come in there. The Rotterdam cardiologists are smart. They know how to write papers and how to know how to do studies. So what they said is they measured lung function in these individuals with arteriosclerosis over 10 years of time. And what they saw is that if you have arteriosclerosis and you look at mortality, mortality on the axis here, you realize that you have no COPD and you have no statins, the mortality of these individuals over 10 years will be almost 50%. 50% of the people with arteriosclerosis will be dead after 10 years. If you treat these people with statins, that's what the cardiologists have proven, that statins prevent mortality rates from so arteriosclerosis. That's the signal that there is, and that's probably quite comparable to what the data is out there. What is interesting is that if the same population is looked at for lung function of people that have COPD, the mortality of these people changes from something like 45% to almost 75%. 75%. So having a bad lung function in conjunction with arteriosclerosis, that's the other way around, sort of is a bad predictor for outcome. Now, if you treat those individuals now with statins that have COPD and arteriosclerosis, their risk to die is almost as low, if you want, or as identical to those people that don't have the disease. So modification of risk, be it in another end, which is not lung function as such, but the comorbid conditions may drive outcome in the future, and this is why you have to develop strategies for the treatment of a chronic disease that comprises more than organ, one organ entity with some drug treatment that it just does more than that. And the last example is that this, this is the phosphodiesterase inhibitor. That's the drug that is good for frequent exacerbators that have a chronic bronchitis. What does this drug do? It improves lung function to some extent. It reduces exacerbation to some extent. But what it really does is it lowers blood glucose. It reduces HbA1c over 12 weeks, and it does it in a similar fashion that any oral antidiabetic drug would do. And it does that by reducing blood glucose levels there as well. This is what these drugs can do, developed for an anti-inflammatory treatment for the lung. Why is this? Bless you. Why is it? It is because the target molecule that this drug's on is GLP-1. GLP-1 is the target for oral, no new oral, oral antidiabetic drugs, 
happens by chance that it is the same target, but it results into something which is outcoming in a better effect on exacerbations and lung function in these individuals. Interesting, isn't it? The last bit is exercise. And the exercise story is extremely important because it drives all these outcomes. It fits together with the glucose, the hyperglycemia, the cardiovascular risk, and the super D. If you exercise, you do something to your muscle, don't you? Most of this is good. But everything that you do with the rehab, and that's an extremely important sort of column of what, whatever we do, cannot be explained by only just ex oxygen expenditure. Because all the structural changes in, in, in the muscle is very difficult to explain by a few watts that you do during the day. So the mechanism is extremely complex and very, very interesting. So exercise drives structural changes, and there is now a molecular mechanism that has been developed and being found out, which is extremely interesting. So this is the data from the science article from Kelly that I would suggest you to read, and there's a Borstrom article in, in, in Nature that is a very good covering of this. The background is that if you have mild COPD and mild cardiovascular disease for that matter, the number of activity or the daily activity goes down, and it goes down to quite an extent. So you are, young people amongst you, uh, no, pot no couch potatoes, no PC lovers, you will walk around 9,000 steps per day. We're not talking about exercise, we're not talking about treadmill. We're talking about steps that you take. It's about 9,000. In the US, the medium is 7,500 for obvious reasons, but you know, that is our activity level. If you have very mild impairment, that is only symptoms and no function, lung function impairment yet, or very mild cardiac disease, your activity levels go, will go down statistically and significantly. 1,000, 1,500 steps less. This leads to something which is bad. It leads to structural changes in the, in, in the muscle that makes it very difficult to rehabilitate you. It increases your cardiovascular risk, as you know, and it increases your metabolic risk for insulin uh, dependency. If you look at 400,000 individuals, and you follow them up for 70 years, and the Chinese paper from The Lancet, and you look and you compare very high to medium to low activity, and you look for all-cause mortality, cancers, diabetes, maladies, and cardiovascular disease, the relation is very simple. If you don't move, you die more readily of all these conditions. What is the difference between medium and high activity? Is it a marathon a year? No, it isn't. Is it 1,500 calories a day? No, it isn't. It is 15 minutes exercise during the day. 15. And not on a treadmill, it's walking. That's it. If you don't do this, it drives outcomes to a large extent. If you do do it, you reduce it for cancers, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. That's what we're talking about. If you look at a cohort of COPD patients, that our, that's our cohort, and you see what they die from. They die from all sorts of reasons, obviously, and there are risk factors for mortality. But the risk factors that are very important is body mass index, fat-free mass index, steps per day is walked, and the most significant one as an independent risk factor for death, other than lung function, is physical activity levels. So this drives outcomes in COPD patients to a large extent. So we have to understand what's happening there. If your fat is sitting with you on the couch, it's not very helpful because the fat undergoes structural changes from a lean person with normal metabolic function, which has a balanced vascular function, to the mildly obese, to the obese person, where fat cells become a source of inflammation themselves. They drive inflammatory responses and they increase vascular risk in these individuals. So these changes are actually quite well known. And there's a nature review that I would uh, suggest you to read. So that's what we knew. So going from here to there is not only an aesthetic problem, it's a problem of a metabolic fate of your body composition. And it's not only the fat cells, but it's the smooth muscle cells or the striated muscle cells that you have to learn about. Hanschen and Spiegelman, Nature, 2008. Very, very good paper that you need to know. Chronic exercise leads to a regression of a lot of genetic information to the muscle that will sort of confer structural changes that you observe in, in activity. It's not only fiber composition and the, the, the preference of C fibers. It's something that is a genetically programmed to actually sort of re reduce and relate to inflammation and detoxification of oxygen radicals. Obesity, on the other hand, if you don't do all that, leads to a chronic inflammatory response also in, this, in, in the muscle. Alva has been doing this for 10, 10 years ago. There's biopsy data on this. It's extremely interesting. So the molecular mechanism of this is very interesting.
What we did learn, learn now, and now it gets, gets very, very interesting, is that there is a cofactor of activation, that's a transcription cofactor of PIPAR PIPA gamma. PIPAR gamma is what you probably know on the drug classes, which are glitazones. The glitazones are PIPAR gamma agonists. The glitazones is the drugs that were developed for to treat metabolic syndrome. They didn't make it because they had side effects. There's a co-activator of PIPAR gamma that is the glitazone-like effect that is activated on exercise in these individuals. If these people exercise, there's a signal transcription factor that leads to the release of a new hormone that's been discovered 18 months ago. It's called irisin. Irisin is the, the goddess, the Greek goddess, is the messenger. She was very pretty and very efficient. Irisin is a drug and a hormone being released by cleaving from after the, with the cold factor PIPAR gamma, that PG on uh, one alpha, into the bloodstream. And what's happening is that when you exercise and you increase the transcription factor, you change your white blood cells, your white fat cells, that may be metabolically changed, to brown fat cells. And that is a process we call browning. Do you know, remember what brown fat cells are? We have them. We have them when we are born. Brown fat cells are the cells that confer thermal stability. They, they heat. And for hibernation, you need brown fat cells because they have a high energy expenditure. If you increase the level of brown fat cells, your energy expenditure favors burning of calories to the end. What does it do? It reduces cardiovascular risk. It rebalances metabolic fate. So glitazones did exactly that. Irisin is now being developed as a drug. And the good news for all of us in the room, including Professor Fabri, in five years, you don't have to exercise anymore, Leo. You take irisin as a drug, and whatever it's doing with exercise, irisin will do immediately with just swallowing it once a day because it will change your white fat cells to brown, brown fat cells. What it will do, it will treat and increase um, caloric access, and it will sort of help you to be more fit. And that is where cardiovascular risk and COPD risks and exercise will hold together. So if you look at effects beyond the lungs of COPD, there are in fact, and as a summary, there are multiple associations with other diseases, and I showed you this. Cardiovascular ones and metabolic ones are probably the most important one. There is a group of people that has something which, is this, which we call systemic inflammation. It doesn't seem to be overt in everyone. And some people are driven by this response and some people are not. And I think we haven't understood the mechanism of this right, and we have to understand that subgroup on this. Epidemiologically, uh, there's no question that if you have a bad function and you have symptoms, it could be cardiac or pulmonary, your risk ratio for dying is getting, getting high. But what we don't know is whether these comorbid conditions and the, the, these inflammatory responses are really causally related to the disease or whether they just coexist. They do coexist to a large extent and they drive outcome, but what the mechanism of that is, I think it's still a matter of research, I think it's interesting. For the practical terms and everything that I told you, to treat patients with COPD means inevitably that you have to treat the comorbid conditions as well, be it metabolic fate, hyperglycemia, inactivity, cardiac risk, and a few lung drugs, obviously. And that's something that you have to do together, and this is why I believe that this disease is very much a general medicine disease rather than a, 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 a specific one. And the physical activity thing is something which has changed from a rather remote rehab thing to a molecular biology at its very best discipline. To understand how physical activity impacts on health and disease and how to understand on a molecular level how you can train your muscle to be less inflammatory, retrain your, your fat cells to become sort of, to, to get brown and fit, something which is now extremely hot and that's where the area is going and it will benefit all areas including the heart and the lung. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus, for this comprehensive and very nice uh, overview. Just time for one question, and it has to be very bright. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> why don't you ask yourself yet? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, you address the issue of the activity versus uh, severity. And one of the missing link uh, in all this course, apart from the one from Manino that you presented, is exactly the complexity of the, of the patient, the terminology and the complexity uh, 
of the patient uh, reflected in a severity index of the patient, not in the severity index of the disease. So what is your proposal there? I mean, what, how do you see the future there? You know, the elderly coming with uh, multiple diseases, uh, how do you see the future? Will be labeling him, uh, you know, with, uh, with a different term and how we would assess uh, the severity. I know it's not simple, but I like, you know, your thinking. Well, there's three things. I, I do believe that the good thing about the Manina score, A, differentiates, obviously, so it uh, certifies very well. It's the Charlton Index. I think the Charlton Index has, has to play a role in there, and I do believe that it's something that we need to take on board more vigorously. And I do believe that if the end point, look at public health terms, five million deaths, how do you change death? Death in COPD you change through the heart. It is the most successful strategy. If you understand the, the cardiac complications COPD, the signal on death probably would be bigger than anything we do with the inhaler drugs. If you do something for patient benefit, if you do something for activity levels, quality of life, and comorbid conditions, I think it's exercise and it's straighted muscle and metabolic fate, which is the issue that is completely underrepresented. Everything we do does not take into account that the people have a heart and that the people have a pancreas. And that is probably something that drives us a lot. And since exercise is such a great component of linking these three together, I think sort of, you know, that's where the research needs to be going to. And I think we are underserving the community, not to stress this efficiently, because the change in death in the, in the, in the Chinese study, and it's 400,000 people, the level of exercise is not higher. It's, regu it's activity. It's, it's regular activity. It's 15 minutes. That's it. Cancer. Yeah, in line uh, with this um, uh, concept, uh, there is a paper that uh, I think that if I understand the second reviewer comments is uh, from uh, Klaus as well, uh, showing that in early COPD, not mild, early COPD, uh, inactivity is a major risk factor, yeah. almost as heavy yeah. as uh, smoking. Yeah. Inactivity. Yeah. So it goes yeah. very well yeah. in line with what you just said. And, the good and news probably is, Peter yeah. was the third of you. <laughs> the, the, good, the good news is, in the future, it may be, it may be the pill to brown your fat and that you're okay. Yeah. Um, you miss the fun of exercising then. But I do think in, in, a sh in short term, what we've learned is it is, it is low-level exercise, and what we do now, we have these activ activity meters of people, sort of, you know, steps taken, and we measure arisen. Arisen is there's an essay for that. And if you tell people with a very simple program to actually just increase some activity, and you're talking about 150 calories a day, that's ex expenditure, the arisen levels go up. You can measure this. So there is a, there's a real pathophysiological mechanism that drives this. And I would put to you that it is very likely that you will change, change outcome in, in, a, in a relatively short period of time. That's my, my suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Klaus. Very nice uh, lecture.